Kathleen Martin from Yale University, and we are here today at Vascular Discovery 2019 in Boston, the American Heart Scientific Sessions meeting. And I'm so pleased to be here today with Dr. Rosie Kaplan from the National Cancer Institute, who just gave a fantastic talk this morning about the role of the vasculature in creating a metastatic niche. Um, and you did, uh, you used this beautiful quote to start off your talk to talk about the importance of the metastatic niche. And I wonder if you could share that with, uh, with our audience here. Yes, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, Paget, uh, who uh, first thought about cancer and how it spreads, uh, in 1889 talked about uh, the tumor being a seed and how it, uh, a seed carried in the wind can only really grow and survive in congenial soil. And uh, I, think, I think it's a perfect quote for really understanding the process. I think we know more and more now about cancer and its, and its initiation and, it, uh, and the etiology of it. I think you know, many, many people have questions you know, how cancer starts, but I think we know a lot about the genetic alterations that can lead to the process. But I still think a lot of the mystery is uh, when a cancer spreads to distant sites and how it, it, it um, can, can uh, be in different environments and survive and grow there. Even though maybe it started in the breast or it started in the bone, it, it can grow and survive in the lung. And one of the things we know about that is that uh, tumors can create an environment even distantly communicating to distant sites um, to set up a kind of niche or uh, kind of launching pad or a nest for those disseminated tumor cells. And so I felt that uh, I love horticulture and that analogy kind of suited me in terms of that it's not just the characteristics of the seed, but the soil and their interaction that's essential for the growth and survival of those cells. So you used, used some very exciting methods to identify a, a really novel finding about the cells that really help pave the way for this fertile soil for the metastasis. So can you tell us about your lineage tracing methods and what you found about the role of perivascular cells? Yeah. So we were very excited to understand the specific components of the microenvironment. So the microenvironment's a broad term that kind of constitutes all aspects of it, but each uh, cell and cell type we think has a role. And I think for the most part, uh, most of the cancer community has um, identified cells as being either immune cells or non-immune cells. And the non-immune cells they categorize into endothelial cells that are clearly the cells that form the vasculature. And fibroblasts. And because I think there are a host of other stromal cells that are uh, maybe play pivotal roles in this biology but have not been well identified, we, we talk about them as cancer-associated fibroblasts or, or, or CAFs. And, and their, their identity and role are very um, not well understood in any field, not just the cancer field. And so we became interested in sort of understanding the biology of these cells better. And uh, in order to do that, we um, decided to look at some of the markers, and one of the markers that we found was a PGF receptor alpha, uh, that's platelet-derived growth factor receptor alpha, and its, its function is not very well known, but it is on perivascular cells as well as fibroblasts. And this gave us the idea that perhaps these are perivascular cells, cells that surround the blood vessel and support and instruct the endothelial cells, which are the blood vessel forming cells. Uh, and so we used a model where we could label just the perivascular cells, and they would stay labeled because sometimes these cells can go incognito, meaning they lose uh, markers that we use to identify them, so they go like in witness protection program and get out and move, and if they're not really where we suspect them to be, then we have trouble identifying them as that. So this marks them whether or not they're near the blood vessel or away from the blood vessel. Um, and this was an essential tool to characterize them because otherwise, when they leave the blood vessel, they can really look like other cells and act like other cells, and it's hard to track. Right, so you use two different fate mapping or lineage tracing strategies to use a, what we think of as a classical smooth muscle marker, a myosin heavy chain, to mark parasites, as well as a more specific parasite marker, NG2. And you show that both of these labeled populations uh, migrate away from the blood vessel and form this niche. And they're involved in remodeling the matrix. So can you expand a little on how that remodeled matrix promotes tumor uh, metastatic invasion. Right. So we were surprised about that. We originally, our original model included both vascular muscle cells and pericytes. And we thought that maybe the pericytes would be a very small subset of the population that was contributing to this niche environment and this supportive environment. And it turned out when we used the myosin heavy chain 11 model, as you said, that's specific to 
um, vascular muscle cells and includes both vascular muscle cells and pericytes, we saw a very good uh, expansion and migration of these cells. When we looked at the NG2 model, which uh, NG2 is a marker of a, of a pericyte of a specific subset of pericytes, so there are multiple uh, subsets and we're not clear of all of their uh, functions, but this particular population was really similar to the myosin heavy chain 11, very uh, increased in numbers and proliferative and thought to have uh, an important role. Um, and so that was pretty surprising to us. And I think the, the interesting part of it was that they, um, not only were they moving away and, and um, actually having a different appearance, but that they were producing this extracellular matrix. And fibronectin is just one of many extracellular matrices. It's normally present in the lung, so it wasn't so that it was so new to find it there, but that it was so increased in number and, and amount and quality was very important. And the architecture of the lung almost visually changed based on the fact that there was this um, expansion and alteration of, of fibronectin. Um, and there was a lot of question as to what that meant in terms of, of cancer metastasis. Uh, in general, we don't think of uh, cancer metastasis as a fibrotic process or fibrosis happening, and yet we saw these changes in extracellular matrices that are associated with fibrosis. And we thought potentially they could have a role directly in the tumor. And it turns out that fibronectin in particular supports not only the growth uh, and adhesion of the tumor cells, but also their stem-like qualities. So we kind of make the tumor cells um, more plastic, and they can be quiescent, meaning not growing. This uh, allows them to survive and evade uh, chemotherapies that are kind of um, targeting cells that are growing very, very quickly so that they will not be killed by the chemotherapy. And that's particularly interesting because that allows you think, oh, if the cell isn't growing, we don't have to worry about it. But cells that don't grow s can grow again. So it's not so good to evade the chemotherapy treatment and then be able to grow again. So we think fibronectin could be contributing that to that role, as well as um, sort of uh, enhancing uh, the um, proliferative capacity. So it has this dual role. It, causes, it can cause quiescence or stopping proliferation and also can promote their proliferation. Um, and then the last aspect that we think is could be critical, although there are probably other ways that fibronectin could be enhancing this process, is that it, it allows the cells to crawl. So it's interesting, it in increases adhesion, so they hold on tight, but it also allows them to walk along it, the fibronectin, almost makes tracks. And so we're wondering if it not only helps it to spread out from the blood vessel, but then into the parenchyma and move from there. Um, and so it's an interesting sort of uh, nest it's not only a nurturing nest, but it's also a migratory nest. So I think it promotes even potentially further spread. And that gets up to a lot of questions that we have in the field about whether metastases can metastasize. So can one metastatic lesion in the lung spread to other areas in the lung and not just from the primary tumor? So you could have spread from the primary localized site, whether it be bone or breast or brain or wherever the primary tumor is, and then to the other distant sites as well. So it's pretty interesting. Definitely, and, and along this theme of plasticity, it was really uh, interesting that you identified KLF4 as a main driver as the transition in the activation and migration of these perivascular cells, and KLF4 was required for the formation of this fibronectin. So that was exciting as we know KLF4 is important in a lot of stem cell biology and mm -hmm. in smooth muscle phenotypic switching. Um, transcription factors like KLF4 are unfortunately hard to target, but the fact that you found this really interesting role for fibronectin in creating this niche suggests, do you think that maybe the matrix could be a potential area for future inhibition of metastases? Yeah, so these, these, are, these are thoughts that we talk about a lot in the lab. You know, the fact that KLF4 is part of the uh, core uh, pluripotency transcription factors makes it very interesting to really understand how adult uh, uh, stem cells or even adult differentiated cells that are not supposed to be so plastic really do have plasticity, whether have ability to sort of change their behavior and change their function in the setting of cancer. And I think we're finding more and more this happens not only in the, st in the stromal populations but in the immune populations as well. And KLA4 interestingly is really important in that, but it's also really important in maintaining your stem cells. So it's not something I think we would want to um, directly target without really understanding how we're going to go about that. So as you say, I think it's a it's interesting, and I think it's it's definitely future um, uh, thinking to say, okay, how therapeutically are we going to manipulate these cells to understand them? But I think KLF4 is something I think that we have to keep 
um, understanding its biology and understanding its downstream effects to say maybe some of the downstream effects are easier to target. Uh, the transcription factors, though, such as KLF4, um, are really driving it. And I think that was so interesting that it's directly upregulated in response to tumor secreted factors. So it gives me the sense that even a localized tumor could be secreting factors that are upregulating KLF4 in distant sites. And I mm -hmm. thought that was really interesting to us because I thought KLF4 transcription factor upregulation would be more directly in the cells that were neighboring. But we found this upregulation in sites that were distant from it so that there's long distance and local communication. And I, I think that, that it, it's useful from that way just as a marker to understand which cells are activated. Um, and then from the clinical realm, should we be looking at that transcription factor in tissues and to see if patients, uh, what perivascular cells are, are maybe moved away from the vasculature and don't look like we would count them as perivascular cells, maybe they are activated and we could use KLF4 as a marker that way to look at that. So that's one aspect. But I think, as you said, looking at the results of KLF4 activation are going to be the key to really understanding it. And extracellular matrix remodeling is complex, but I do think it's something we could target. One of the interesting approaches we took in the in, the, in our studies was to target um, an integrin, alpha-4, beta-1, which is uh, w expressed both on um, the tumor cells as well as other cell types, and it's used for the tumor cell to bind to fibronectin. So maybe we can't particularly target fibronectin directly, but if we can prevent the tumor cell from binding fibronectin um, and growing, then it would be effective. And at least in the murine models that we did, we showed when we targeted the integrin, we were able to um, really uh, decrease metastasis very, very similarly actually to when we target KLF4 sp genetically, specifically in the perivascular population. So it was interesting, I think, how they phenocopied each other so well. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your work with us here at Vascular Discovery. Um, you've certainly found fundamental new insights into how the metastatic niche is formed and raised a lot of exciting possibilities for how we think about diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment in the future. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me.